Did you know that one out of every 200 people have little structures in their brain that looks like raspberries? Yesterday I presented the case of a 19 year old female that presented to the emergency department with a really bad headache. On the first presentation to the emergency department, she was given medications and sent home. When those headaches did not improve, she came back to the emergency department where a CAT scan of her brain was done that showed this finding right here. That is blood in her brain. We subsequently ordered an MRI of her brain that showed this finding. You can see the little spot right here as well as right here. There was very few of you guys in the comment section that got this right. This is a ruptured cavernous angioma, also known as a cavernous malformation or a cavernoma. One out of every 200 people are born with them. Essentially, they're a cluster of thin-walled capillaries. Think of them like a cluster of leaky blood vessels. And like any vascular structure that's abnormal in our brain, they can actually rupture and bleed. The good news about these types of lesions is that the blood flow through them is very slow. But when they bleed, they don't actually bleed a whole lot. They can be present in the brain or the spinal cord, and depending on what part of the brain or spinal cord they lie, the bleeding can cause a variety of different symptoms. In our patient's case, her cavernoma sits within her right frontal lobe, which essentially doesn't cause many symptoms if they rupture. So that's why she only presented with a headache. In fact, in most cases where cavernomas rupture, the symptoms are typically headache or seizures. Now, depending on where in the brain or spinal cord these lesions are located, hemorrhage can cause a variety of different presentations. For example, a cavernoma in this spot of the brain will cause contralateral weakness if it does hemorrhage. A lesion in the spinal cord right here could potentially cause someone to be paraplegic if it bleeds. And a cavernoma in the brainstem could potentially be life-threatening if it hemorrhages. These are non-cancerous lesions that are present at birth, meaning that something happens during development of these blood vessels and it causes them to cluster together. They're not cancerous and usually do not grow, but over the course of a patient's life, they could hemorrhage or bleed. They're usually sporadic, meaning they are not hereditary, and typically one lesion is seen. And most of the time they are found as an incidental finding on imaging, meaning the patients aren't having symptoms. However, in about 20% of patients that have cavernous malformations will have multiple, and they almost always have a familial cavernous malformation syndrome. That means it's hereditary and family members should be screened for this. It's thought to be related to a gene mutation. Because the cells that line the blood vessels within a cavernoma are somewhat thinner than normal, they are prone to leaking. Don't worry because the risk of bleeding from these types of lesions is very small, anywhere from a quarter to 1% annual risk. That means if you have 100 people that have a cavernous malformation, only one of them will experience a small hemorrhage in a year. Now that risk is somewhat higher in patients that have brainstem cavernomas, where the risk is about two to 3% per year. So how do we diagnose them? CAT scans are really only helpful in the acute phase if a patient has recently experienced a hemorrhage. And sometimes it's so small that you might even miss it. MRI almost always establishes the diagnosis. It's usually a smooth, well-circumscribed, popcorn-shaped lesion within the brain. And they're usually surrounded by a low-signal intensity hemosiderin rim. If the lesion has recently bled, you may see signs of swelling around the lesion. A cerebral angiogram or even a CTA will be negative on these, and this is a tool that you can use to rule out other types of vascular malformations. All right, well, how do we treat them? Conservative approach is usually utilized, meaning usually we don't rush in there and take them out. Because the risk of bleeding is low and even the bleeds that do happen are usually very small, surgical risks often outweigh the risks of bleeding. And remember, in patient care and when recommending treatment options, we always want to outweigh the risks versus the benefit to figure out what's best for the patient. Indications for surgery are progressive neurological deficits, intractable epilepsy or seizures related to the cavernoma, or cavernomas that really are pretty easy to resect, meaning they're a non-eloquent cortex of the brain, so removing them isn't very risky. If they are operated on, you have to remove the entire lesion as well as all the bleeding that has damaged the brain surrounding the lesion. This will minimize the risk of rebleeding and or seizures related to the brain injury surrounding the spot. Occasionally, there are lesions that are in eloquent cortex like the brainstem, 
and these spots may need to be removed by a surgeon that is highly specialized. Obviously, removing spots like this can be extremely risky. Stereotactic radiosurgery is sometimes utilized in inaccessible lesions. However, there have been studies that show significant complications and or side effects related to the radiation. When surgical resection of the lesion is considered, we often do it after the lesion has had time to cool off from the hemorrhage. In our patient's case, she did go on to develop a seizure disorder related to the lesion, so she ended up having surgery to resect it without any complications. That's because it was in a non-eloquent cortex of the brain, and always remember we have to outweigh the risks versus benefit anytime we're considering surgery. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.